come from a 48 year old man. He ain't running from me, he's coming to fight. How you doing everyone? My name is Ryan and guess what? Ade is gone again. He's on holiday, this time he's in Cuba. He's not back for a couple weeks, so this week, I'm going to give you this week in boxing again. Hopefully we'll get Ade on Skype next week. We tried today, but technical difficulties, we couldn't do it. That's why I'm sitting in front of the TV, because he should have been here. Alright then, let's start with this weekend's fights. Let's start with Robert Guerrero. I didn't see the fight as of yet, so I'll just quick brief. He won a split decision against Aaron Martinez. Um, in a fight that many people are saying, it kind of answers more questions than gives answers. In a sense, whereas Guerrero was supposed to win this fight, look impressive, and move forward. It was a tough fight. He got dropped mid-rounds, had to rally back, come back strong late. Where does that leave Guerrero now in the World Weight Rankings? The rankings are changing a lot right now. We got Khan and Brook fought the week before. We've got Adrian Broner coming up shortly. We've got Timothy Bradley coming up shortly. A lot of changes in the World Weight Division. So let's see what happens on there. Um, Miguel Cotto last night. Great victory, good win. Fourth round TKO, very impressive. Cole looked like a younger version of Cole. He came in very light, we'll get to that shortly, but um, he was fast, he was light, light, light on his feet, put his punches together well, and he basically beat up Gil. Something I did not see coming. He didn't look very confident going in, into the fight. Maybe that weight drain of coming down to the extra three pounds, or was Cole just that good? Cole is a Hall of Famer. Me and Adi are both fans of Cole, but we were both questioning whether he's a legit middleweight and Gil being a bigger, bigger guy, it didn't seem that way. Yes, Gil was bigger in the ring, but the heavier, harder, crisper blows came from Carl. I was disappointed in Gil, where I thought Gil would have tried to impose his size, use his jab more, use that finesse work rate he had, but he couldn't seem to get it going at all. Carl said that I'm in the interview last week, two weeks ago, was that the year layoff was the best thing for him, because it gave him a chance to refresh, heal, reevaluate. He also said that Freddie Roach, having that time to work with Freddie, is giving him more dimensions. And I could see that. Cotter was very respectful to Freddie Roach in the post fight interview, saying he thanks Freddie for everything because he's actually had a chance to actually train, develop, and come in the way he wants to come in in the fight. So, um, great win. Where does that leave Miguel Cotter at the middle division? I do not know. Cole's a great fighter. He's a Hall of Famer. He has all the abilities you want within a fighter. But what he doesn't have is size. As you know, he came in at 153 pounds for the fight, which I'll touch on again shortly. Being, being a small middleweight, it makes me wonder who will he fight next. They're talking about Canelo, and they're already talking about a catchweight of 155 pounds. If he wins that fight, what, does, what options does it leave him? He cannot consistently ask bigger guys to come into weight classes. And if they, he did say previously that if the WBC forced him to fight someone, namely GGG, when he's not ready for it, he will vacate the belt. As a champion, as a Hall of Famer, I don't think he will want to vacate, but he also doesn't want to be pushed around. And I think that also means being pushed around by sanctioning bodies, by promoters, or by opponents who are bigger and stronger than him. So he's got to pick his spots carefully. Also yesterday, just a quick few brief bits. Um, American Olympian Dominic Brazil won with a third round stoppage. Um, Dominic Brazil seems like a decent prospect. He's got the size of a modern heavyweight, but he doesn't have the look of a modern heavyweight. He still seems a little fleshy. Um, I think he's the type of guy that they're gonna start making waves with him and start pushing him, especially while having the UK, we've got Anthony Joshua, who again, um, 13 and 0, undefeated, with 13 KOs, Brazelli is 15 and 0 with 14 KOs, so you're going to start hearing about comparisons about how, where they could be down the line, but I do not expect them to match him hard or match him tough going forward. I still think they're trying to test out the waters. Um, the guy you fought yesterday was an undefeated guy, 17 fights I think, but it was one of those guys where it looked like a padded record more than anything else. The way things are going right now with the heavyweight division, there's a lot of names, a lot of contenders, a lot of young guys coming up. If they match these guys well, develop them well, we can see a very, very interesting 18 months, two years, if everyone's match well and actually takes risks. 
Um, also, Alfred Angulo came back and he had a first victory in three or four years. He went a five round stoppage of a guy called Reigns. Again, when fighters lose a lot of one weight class, they seem to uh, make excuses and say, oh, I'm struggling at the weight and going up. Going up one weight class, maybe. Struggling to make the weight and coming in a little bit heavy, not a good sign, not a good look. Let's hope Angulo oils it back down and gets back down to junior middleweight. Okay, let's go with the news from the week. And I'm gonna stick with Miguel Cotto and his weight. Miguel Cotto came in for his fight against Daniel Gill at 153 pounds, 0.6 which is under the junior middleweight limit. I'm actually disappointed is that now the sanctioning bodies, now the commissions, no one's mentioned anything about it. I mean, you have weight classes for a reason, to protect the fighters and have it as a fair fight. Yes, there was a catch weight at 157, but he came in under the middleweight limit. Um, there was a time when catch weights were there for a reason, and when I say a reason or I could understand why there was a catch race, as I mentioned in previous videos, I don't see why you got a guy who, no matter how great he is, is the legit, the lineal middleweight champion of the world. He should not be able to fight and defend his title if he cannot make the weight, be it over the weight or under the weight. At the time he weighed in, he was officially a junior middleweight. He's won the belt, he's become the fourth, uh, four time world champion for Puerto Rico, Great achievement, great accolade. If you can't make the weight, drop back down. Um, Cotto said in his Pearl's Fight interview on HBO, well, look at my weight, and that answers your question. He's acknowledging that he's not a middleweight. He's acknowledging that the size is not, not an advantage to him. He said midweek that if, <clears throat> if Gil didn't make the weight, then the fight would basically be off. Freddie Roach made a statement in the week along the lines of, if Gil doesn't make the weight, we have replacements. We have other people in line to take his spot. Which tells me again, but he doesn't want to fight middleweights. And it sounds bad, but you can't you can't say you're a middleweight, you're a middleweight champion and you won't fight at middleweight. You've got to make a decision. Relinquish the belt or move back down. Oscar De La Hoya has come out and says that he's feeling to come back into boxing. He feels that he's got the desire, he's got the bars. He's feeling that little itch in his back to say, yep, yeah, it's time to make a comeback and come back into boxing. Um, I saw a few interviews him mention about it and he says he's going to get back into training and see how he feels and take it bit by bit by bit. And I'm really, really confused with this one. I'm confused with this one to a state where, as I'm not sure if Oscar is coming back for because he wants to come back or is he coming back to save his company golden boy let's be honest from the mid 90s upwards he was the golden boy he made the highest paid checks he had all the pay-per-view numbers he's done everything he's supposed to do he made stars out of Mayweather in their fight where he made where Mayweather the pay-per-view star he made Pacquiao the pay-per-view star he made Hopkins the pay-per-view star um and now it's all turned sour on him. He was gonna to try to take over boxing. He was gonna to try to do what Al Heyman is doing is by controlling all the boxing from one entity. That was the plan between him and Schaefer. Through to Oscar's personal problems, due to Schaefer's dodgy business dealings, due to Al Heyman taking up all the fighters around him, Al Heyman has took that mantle and ran with it. He's really taken over the sport. Oscar now is in a position he's unused to be, being in now. He's now a backseat driver. He is no longer in position, in control. I think Oscar wants to come back, not because he has got the itch, because he wants to save his company. He feels if he could get a little bit of the limelight, take a little bit of shine, he could overtake the other fighters. And for me, that's a dangerous thing. Oscar has not fought in seven years. Oscar is in his mid forties. Um, yeah, there's certain things about fighters that Fighters normally don't have it, and they have to pick their spots. Oscar done the smart thing, I think, after he lost to Pacquiao. Uh, he knew he didn't have it. But normally when you have great fighters, you see a trend. Whereas, they win, they win, they win, they win, they win, they win. They might have a loss, but they win, they win, they win. Then you look at the last five, six fights, you start seeing losses, losses, win, loss, win, loss. Now, regardless if the people he lost to towards the end of his career was Bernard Hopkins, who was a top three or top two pound for pound in the world at the time. Um, 
Pacquiao, who was a top pound for pound at the time, and Mayweather, who was top pound for pound at the time. Those are losses that it shows that the end was coming towards him. Oscar, in my opinion, could have competed with Pacquiao or Floyd in his prime. In those fights, he couldn't compete. There was a, a, a clear sign of slippage. Now he wants to come back. I don't think it's a good idea. He's mentioned um, quite laughably that if he comes back, he wants GGG. For a guy that's never hasn't fought in seven years, for a guy that's going to have to tread the waters to see if he can make it through a camp without getting injured, for a guy that needs to um, actually have fights, and Oscar was only fighting maybe once, maybe twice a year, to say you want GGG, in Oscar's terms, you're mostly talking about two years from now. That is not a realistic opponent for Oscar. One, he's got to win a fight. Two, he's got to get ranked. And three, if he wants to build his brand, he's not going to fight a risk like GGG to kill his brand. Shane Mosley and Roy Jones came out this week saying, oh, we'll fight Oscar, we'll fight Oscar, we want to fight Oscar. And someone, someone, someone said about make it like a Legends type match. Bad move. Shane Mosley's retired for a reason. Same thing like Oscar. He knew the time was come. He could no longer compete at the highest levels. Yes, he's still a great a Hall of Famer. He was a great fighter. But again, he can compete with the B class guys, but he can't compete with the A class guys no right now. He beat Mo he beat um De La Hoya twice before, but De La Hoya is no longer an A class guy. He's been retired, so of course Mosley wants to jump in the mix. Roy Jones, who is a much bigger man than De La Hoya, and again, could no longer compete with the A class in the division. So I don't think any of those guys making any statement or any offer to make to fight Oscar makes any sense at all. All it will be will be um, a exhibition match for boxing, which boxing doesn't need. Right now, to me, boxing's on a high. Let's keep it on a high. Let's move on to Kel Brook versus Amir Khan. Amir Khan done an interview this week and released statements saying that he's not going to fight Kel Brook right now. He's waiting for the mayor of a fight and if the mayor of a fight does not happen, we're trying to fight Adrian Broner or Keith Thurman. Both good fights, both entertaining fights, both fights the fans will want to see. I'm still getting really, really confused with his motives and his statements and the things he's saying. Uh, Kel Brook is a world champion. Yeah, it's a large, it's a huge fight in the UK. It's a big fight in the states, state side as well. Yes, under the whole PBC Al Heyman stuff, it's mostly his fighters fighting his fighters. But there are instances where Matchroom, who look after Kell Brook, do have fights with, with Al Heyman. So the fight is markable. It can sell on both sides. Khan's fans always seem to say that Brook is Brook is a step back. Brook hasn't proved himself. I can understand that argument. That yes, the last fight he had with Frankie Gavin and George Rodan were not the type of fights you expect of the highest level. He Kelbrook won easily and handily, but you want better B sides. Fair enough. But Kelbrook is a world champion and he has been in the world rankings at the top of the rankings for a long, long time. Khan does have a bigger hit list and does have um more accolades to shout about. But as it stands right now, Kelbrook is a champion. Kelbrook is um, ranked comparatively with Amir Khan. Amir Khan is in a situation where he feels he is third or fourth in the list of boxing behind the Mavers, the Pacquiao's, the um, Cottles. He feels he's very marketable. To be marketable, you need to fight competitive fights and fight the, the guys, your peers. Algeri was not a good fight for him. It looked easy on paper, but he had a very, very tough fight. If he does not get the mail of a fight, I suggest Amir Khan takes the Brook fight. It's the fight everyone's talking about, it's the fight everyone wants. Yes, the Furman fight will be good. Yes, the Broner fight will be good. Broner still got to go through Sean Porter, which is not a walk in the park. And Furman's got to fight Colazo, which I think is a much more easier match. But still, these are fighters down the line. If these guys got fights set up within the next month or two, and if may have announced that Khan does not have the fight, then I think Khan should step to Kell Brook. Okay. Let's move forward with um, Mayweather and relinquishing his belts. After um, Mayweather vs Pacquiao, Mayweather announced that he's going to relinquish all his belts because the belts are no longer needed for him. He's coming at the end of the stretch. It's time for to free up the belts. 
uh, with that news there, the WBO, um, I will say incorrectly so, announced that their fight between Timothy Bradley and Jesse Vargas is going to be for the vacant WBO title. Um, maybe was kind of reacted that now, saying that uh, he was shocked and surprised to see that a belt he owns, that he hasn't officially re relinquished as of yet, is now on the table for um, Vargas versus Bradley. On the flip side, the WBO has said that, first of all, they haven't received their sanctioning fee, which is $200,000 for the Pacquiao fight. Two, they said that they requested from Mayweather to send them a statement announcing what he's going to do by the 1st of June. Since he didn't do that, they have made this fight for the vacant title. Um, someone might have to clarify with me a little bit because I'm not too sure, but I'm sure this fight was announced for the vacant title before the 1st of June. So, in my opinion, from, if I'm right, that makes the WBO wrong. But, also I'm thinking, this might be Mayweather still trying to hold his hand on the division. I, he wouldn't want to see a title that he owns given off to Bradley or Vargas just like that. I think he was assuming that he will vacate the belts and by the time the sanctioned boys decide who and make eliminators, there will be two or three or four months down the line. He must will have his match, it will kind of, oh, his September match, will kind of overshine everything and he will still be the recognised World Awake Champion. As it stands right now, because the WBO already had the Bradley Vargas fight, who are both ranked within their top 10, both eligible for the title shot, they've given the fight over, which in my opinion hurts Mayweather's markability. I.e., if he kept the if, if he relinquished the belts, but the belts were still vacant, he would still be um unofficially but officially the champion because no one has fought for the belts. By holding on to the belt because they've announced this fight for Vargas Bradley, it actually no if the winner of that fight actually makes Wet Mayweather no longer the champion. I think this is a situation here where Mayweather is using his power and his smarts to hold the division while he makes his choices and also it hurts Bradley he's already got a history with that, with that organization and hopefully he wants to abuse that history and that belt to bargain himself into a marquee match Vargas, Bradley since since the Pacquiao fight Bradley's status has dropped a little bit and he's been fighting good guys but not the top guys and I think he really needs, he's not a push ticket seller, so I think he really needs that belt to help stamp his claim on where he wants to be. If he wants to get in there with the likes of um, the Mayweather, the Furmans, the um, Amir Khans, um, the Porters, the Broners, he needs a belt. He's not gonna go in, he's not gonna get the option to fight those guys, regardless about promotional entities, without something to bring to the table. Because Bradley, as good as he is, as much as people have him in this pound for pound list, as how much, no matter how you have him ranked in the world away list, without the belt, he brings nothing to the table, unfortunately. Okay, I'm gonna move on to um, Deontay Wilder. Um, he's really winding me up. And he's released a statement this week. Two statements, two of them that kind of wind me up a little bit. The first one, he was saying about um, why is he fighting Molina? And he said something along the lines that Molina understands the um, opportunity that's been given towards him. And then they also said that other guys turned down the opportunity to fight him because they didn't understand what was being offered to them. In other words, you offered out low money for fighters to take the fight and they've turned it down. Molina is not a world ranked fighter. He's the independent sanctioning body, let me get that right. You saying that he understands the opportunity means he's getting short money to get a shot at the world heavyweight title, yeah? That is just a way of you marketing yourself to see that people are ducking you or people do not want to fight you. There's a whole lot of fighters that want to fight you. A lot of people want to fight but they're not going to take short money. This is a business. This is a sport. People have got to get paid for it. Taking these type of fights here does not help your career. And then what made it worse for me is that after that statement he said that Kevin Johnson came for a payday against Anthony Joshua and that we won't know how good Joshua he really is until he steps it up. And I thought that sounds like you, Deontay Wilder. 
We don't know how good you are. You're the guy that ain't fought no one either, minus Devon. And Malik Scott had never been top 10 ranked in any sanctioning body, any, any independent sanctioning body ever. And I get to the point to say, whereas it's not that you're criticizing Dante Wilder or saying that he's anything bad about him, but you can't say you ain't fought no one to Anthony Joshua when he ain't really fought no one either. You've got to look at it and be fair to exactly what both fighters are doing. Dante Wilder is a got a towel. He beats the firm fair and square. I thought that was his coming out point. That was his step up in class. He proved his point. But now he's got back to fighting Molina. Take out those two fighters. There's no one in Dante Wilder's record that you could say proved anything to anyone else. So to me, the guys that Anthony Joshua's fighting, the guys that um the, the New Zealand kid um Joseph Parker's fighting, the guys that Dominic Brazil who's fighting, these are these are these are guys that are not great, they're not gonna prove anything to you, but Deontay Wilder done exactly the same thing and got a world title shot. So I think Deontay Wilder shouldn't really criticize any other fighter out there about their opponents or where their ranking is. Okay. Martin Murray has signed with Matchroom Sports. Um, it was announced end of the week. There's going to be a presser on Wednesday, I think. I think it's a good thing for Martin Murray. He's moving to super middleweight. Obviously, they've got um, James Aguilar as a world champion, so I think that's going to be a target down the line. If Murray wins when he has his, come, his first fight on, I think it's the 26th of June. I like this move for Martin Murray. Martin Murray is a big middleweight. He was been a world ranked middleweight for a long time, but obviously um, he's had his shots at middleweight. Obviously he lost to Sturm, he lost to, he got a draw with Sturm, he lost to GGG. Um, there was not much more he could do in the division. Um, he he won a, lost a close one to um, Martinez. So I think Sumer is a good move for him. Only concern I have is that Murray's not a big puncher. As much as he's a big guy, he's not a very big puncher. The Super Midwest there can punch quite a bit. But domestically, look at the division with the likes of um, Callum Smith, um, Paul Smith, um, the James Aguil, George Groves, Rocky Fielding, to name a few. It's a good division for him. He can mix it at European, British level, European level, and at world level because he's got the talent to do it. And a lot of those guys have association with Matchroom. So I think for him as a business point of view, it's a great thing. Sticking with the super middleweights, um, Eddie Hearn said this week that the potential, the potential opponents for James the Girl coming up will be Lucy Mbute, Miguel Kessler, and Bernard Hopkins. Um, guys, you all laugh at me, but expect that if, if that is the list that's going for, expect that list to be Bernard Hopkins. Um, Lucy Mbute, since um, he got absolutely destroyed by Carl Froch, has never been the same fighter. The last time Bute fought was John Pascal, which is mostly about 18 months ago. Um, Mikko Kessler, last time he fought was against Carl Froch, which is most probably over a year ago now. And Mikko Kessler has already said he's in retirement. He's now retired. Yes, fighters changed their mind, but Mikko Kessler has kind of been in similar time for the past couple of years where he's not really fighting very often. To be fair, since the eye injury in the Super 6, Miguel Kessler has not been a very active fighter of full stop. He's already a superstar in Denmark, he's already made a lot of money, he's had some super fights with Froch, with Kawasaki, he has fights with Andre Ward. He's already done what he needs to do, so he has no urgency to come back. He's a multi-time multi Super Mundial champion. He's comfortable, he's happy. Bernard Hawkins on the other side though, is still an active fighter has actually called out saying he wants to come to the UK, which is something he's been mentioning previously to fight. Hopkins does talk a lot sometimes, and if you all remember, he was talking one time about fighting David Hay in the UK. So yes, we know Hopkins can talk and try to sell a story, but to me, this one seems more believable in a sense, whereas Hopkins jumped from middleweight to light heavyweight. He never had a super middleweight title. It's the division, it's the belt that he's never had. So for me, and we know Hopkins can make 168, for me, it's a no-brainer for him to actually drop down to go to that division. Can he win the fight? That's another story. He did not look good in the Kovalev fight. He got dropped early, took a loads and loads of clean shots. Kovalev, to me, is an elite fighter. Kovalev is um, a pound for pounder in my opinion. But Hopkins is 50 years old, 51 years old. By 50 years old, 
There is no way in hell he should be fighting anyone at all at this age. But he does it. Because he does it, it doesn't mean it's good. Because stylistically, Hockey's looking at James Aguil. He's looking at those middle rounds. I think, oh, I could do something there. Oh, we got tired. I could do something there. But Hopkins does not fight at the type of pace or the speed to make the girl tired. But, like I said, guys, if those are the three people on the list, expect Hopkins' name to be facing James the girl down the line if it goes that way. Every time I mention Andre Ward and BET, Ade starts laughing. But BET is going to show nine shows over the next 18 months from Rock, for Rock Nation. That is great for boxing. And in terms of um, the way boxing has changed 2015 for terrestrial TV in America, it could only have a ripple effect around the world for everyone to get these good fights. The criticism that they had before on BET was that it was the black entertainment channel, whereas like the market share and the audience seems to be limited. Well, I found out that BET is in 90 million homes in America over 90 million that makes it a bonus I think I mean that many homes alone to have potential to see your fight is great it, it, it has um, less coverage than domestic than than domestic TV but domestic TV has something like 127 million homes so 90 million yes it's much less but it's still a huge huge market to hit with the PBC with the Rock Nation with these lot of marquee fighters now being taken away from HBO, taken away from Showtime, yes, it affects their coverage, but it gives boxing more coverage all over and. And what will happen with that as well, whereas before you had um, fights only hitting a smaller audience, now the potential for bigger audience is much better, so it's a good thing. David Price is off the uh, matching card on the 26 due to a um, neck injury, um, a strained neck. Uh, I think it's bad news, not good. Um, since his fights with Tony Thompson, he's been fighting mostly in Germany. It would have been good to get the UK fans to see him again and start building the clock for that um, Price versus Joshua fight possibly down the line. Um, I've watched all of Price's fights since he's, since he's gone over to Germany. He still looks a little shaky sometimes, but um, he's a tremendous talent and he's still young as, a, as for a heavyweight. It would have been good for the general public to see him, get behind him, build that momentum again. Let's hopefully they can bring him back over here shortly. Derek Chisora uh, has made a comeback. In a sense, he's got a new team, new camp, and possibly fighting Alexander Yusinov, um put in July. This is a rumor, so it's not guaranteed, nothing set in stone as of yet. Chisora's been inactive since the Tyson Fury fight. Yusinov was actually sparring with, Fury, with um, Chisora, and when Chisora broke his hand and delayed the fight with Fury, that was because of um, Yusinov. Um, Yusinov used to be world ranked top 10, uh, but due to inactivity and a loss to Pulev a couple years ago, um, he's kind of dropped off the radar. The day before Chisora broke his hand in camp, we were there watching them spar. And um, if that fight comes off, it's a very, very entertaining fight and a risky fight for a comeback in Derek Chisora. You know, sometimes when you have a loss or when you change camp, you need a fight just to get your feet wet. Okay, next week's fights, we have, we've got Ishande Lari versus Dublin Rodriguez, which is on Friday. Rodriguez was a decent fighter, but he's never been an A-class fighter. He's always been on the B side. Um, he gets a lot of credit for that fight he had, which is a great fight of a guy called um, Paolo Wolak, about three, four years ago. Um, since that fight, to me, hasn't looked great, great, great. I think Lara has problems getting good fights, so this is a fight to keep him busy, keep the tick to cut ticking over. Also, we got um, my friend. Um, I call him the Wolf, but um, Arthur Bertibiev. He's fighting. No, he's actually fighting the guy. The guy he's supposed to fight is being replaced now. But Bertibiev is fighting next week. Um, don't miss that. It's going to be another highlight reel knockout. Bertibiev is hungry. He wants to fight the best in the division. He already, he's had under 10 fights. He's already asking for the likes of Kovalev and Stevenson and the top guys in the division. Um, he's a monster. He's a beast. Uh, we have Deontay Wilder versus Eric Molina. I think I made a prediction in the video that the fight will last 93 seconds or 91 seconds. I'm sticking to the prediction. Um, this fight will not go one round. Also next week as well, we got Jamaicans in the house. Nicholas Waters. He's going to fight Miguel Mariaga. 
a video for that. Hopefully, get a video for that out this week. And um, that's it from me, guys. Yo, have a good week, and thanks for watching this week in boxing.